Today's scripture reading comes from Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. If you're able, please stand in reverence for God's word. Follow along as I read. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went, to, he went to him and bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer once again. Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege for us to come before you and worship you, God. As we come together this morning, help us to put aside all our worries and concerns of this world. Like the beautiful song the orchestra played, help us to go and carry our, all our burdens to Jesus and find true rest in you alone, God. As we go into your word, hide me beyond cross and speak through God. Speak to our hearts. Touch our hearts, change our lives. God, may we leave this place different than we walked in this morning. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Today's story is one of the most well known stories in the Bible, along with the David and Goliath story in the Old Testament. Even those who are not Christians, familiar with the Christian stories and Christians, know the, what it means to be a Good Samaritan. And we all know the, the word Good Samaritan. And we've all heard and read the story many, many times and heard so many Sunday school stories and heard many sermons. And, and I want us to dig a little deeper into the story today and see what we can learn from the, uh, our story today. Because it's important for us to review and relearn and relook at some of the stories uh, in the scripture. Some of the stories are so familiar that we tend to overlook and glance over and skip and miss the whole point of the story. So I want to pause and take a step back and sit down and look at this story today together. Well, first of all, the whole thing started wrong. The expert in the law asked the question to test Jesus. I mean, expert, there were experts in the law, the Torah, the, the book of law of Moses, the God's law. And there were the experts in the law, and there were Pharisees. Uh, Pharisees and scribes, and scribes are part of the Pharisees. But, uh, so he was not interested in hearing the answer, and Jesus won't give him the answer that easy. The expert in the law asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's all, it was all about him, and he got it all wrong. And Jesus says, well, you are the expert in the law, and what does the law say about it, and how do you read it? 
And the expert's answer is direct quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, seven, verses 17 and 18. And Jesus says, well, good answer, and do this, and you'll live. And Jesus is almost saying, if you want to be saved by the law, go ahead. You know the law. Go ahead, and, and you have the law, and do it. But no one can perfectly follow the law, as we all know. And Romans chapter 7, seven verse 7 through 25 says, the law is there to reveal our sinfulness, not necessarily to save us. The law was never intended, intended or meant to save. And that was not the answer he was expecting. So he counters punches with, who is my neighbor? So the expert of the law thought he got all figured out. He was going to go test Jesus. I'm going I'm to trap him. I got him. And asked this question, and Jesus says, okay, well, you're the expert. What did the law say? And they explain, says, beautiful. It beautiful, gives beautiful answer. And Jesus says, okay, well, you know the answer. And go do it. And then he, he, he was caught off guard, and he's like, oh, well, okay, then who's the neighbor? And then Jesus tells a story. The story goes, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho on the road, and he was robbed. He was robbed and beaten, half dead, and left, uh, stripped naked, and on the road uh, to die. And then the priest and the Levite happened to walk down the road saying, and saw the person who was beaten and stripped of his clothes and bloody and dying, goes to the other side of the road and continue to walk. And then there's a Samaritan walks along, comes along, and sees the man and takes care of him and takes him to the inn and helps him recover. And then some money to the innkeeper says, take care of him. If there's any extra expenses, extra cost, when I come back, I'll repay you. I'll take care of it. Please take care of him. And th that's a simple story, right? So the whole point is that we ought to be like Good Samaritan. Be nice to people. Help other people. But we, gotta, we have to dig a little de uh, deeper into it. And then, first of all, we give the priests and Levites such a hard time for being a, such a heartless human being they are. The priests and Levites are like the pastors and elders and deacons of the church. They're the one who serves at the temple. But we have to understand the culture and their positions at the time. The Bible says they were going down from Jer uh, Jericho to Jerusalem or Jerusalem to Jericho. At that time, Jer Jericho was one of the cities designated, there are few cities designated for a residence of priests and Levites roster for duty in the temple about 28 kilometers away in Jerusalem. And it, it is believed that about 12,000 priests and Levites lived in uh, Jericho, and they were a familiar sight on the road. You see the priests and Levites constantly walking up and down the road, and you see them regularly. So they were either coming home from the temple duty or on an official business at Jericho, or they are on their way to Jerusalem for their duty. So whatever the reason, they were traveling down the road and see the man who was robbed and beaten and half dead, and they both go to the other side of the road and pass the man. And how could they? How heartless? But here's the thing. Those people who were identified to serve at a temple, it's not just they wake, wake up one morning and it's like, you know, I'm going to go serve in the temple, and they just go, get to go do it. But it is a process. They have to prepare their, prepare their heart, prepare their bodies, and they have to prepare themselves to go serve in the temple. And we talked about it. There are 12,000 people, priests and Levites, in Jericho alone, waiting their turn to serve in the temple. It's important. Whenever they, they get an opportunity, they have to prepare. They have to be ready. They have to be, it has to be absolutely perfect to go serve in the temple. And the book of Numbers tells us that and they, we kind of get a glimpse of why they had to cross to the other side of the road. And book of Numbers, chapter 19, verse 11 through 13, it says, Whoever touches the dead body of anyone will be unclean for seven days. 
He must purify himself with the water on the third day on, and on the seventh day. Then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third and seventh days, he will not be clean. Whoever touches the dead body of anyone and fails to purify himself defiles the Lord's tabernacle. That person must be cut off from Israel because the water of cleansing has not been sprinkled on him, and he is unclean. His uncleanness remains on him. If you hear a, a serious issue, if you're a priest and Levites and walking down the road on your way to temple service and sees this uh, half-beaten, robbed, and stripped naked, blooded, dying person, and you go try to help that person, and God forbid something happens, that person dies, then what happens? The scripture says he is unclean for seven days. They can't serve in a temple. But they help the person, they move along, but without their knowledge, what if that person dies? That he hasn't cleaned himself, and the Bible says they'll be cut off from Israel. That's some serious issue, serious matter. And that's why they took this to their heart, and that's why they, they didn't want to have this pe- person. This person who was half bitten, some, some translation uh, points that this person was beaten to the point of death. So whether the priests and Levites, they didn't know whether they were going to make it or not. So they couldn't risk it. They couldn't risk their service to the Lord. And there were about 12,000 people waiting to their, take their spots. So it is important, right? The Bible says they'll be cut off from the Israel, and you, you simply can't risk that. But let us pause for a moment here and be honest with ourselves. Have we ever done that before? How many of us, we were so busy serving, in, serving the Lord, and we neglect those who are dying, suffering around us? Because, oh, I don't have time for that. I'm going to be late to chapel. I'm going to be late, for, late to the lead the orchestra. I'm going to late to sing in a choir. It's like, again, I don't have time to help these people. How many of us do that? The act of worship. The worship ritual, service itself, has become our priority. But it is important for us to understand that through the whole story, I don't think, well, I have to kind of defend for this uh, priest and Levites because I'm, I'm, I'm in the same category of job, I guess. I don't think they were bad people. But they were just so caught up in their own way of worship, and they forgot about the whole meaning of what it means to serve God and worship. Neglecting someone who is sick and dying physically and spiritually because we are caught up and we're so busy with our religious rituals or our idea of worship. I think a lot of us, many of us, we have our own idea of worship what service to the Lord means, that we're so caught up in it, and if someone comes and with anything different, that we sh- kind of shut them out. And it is important for us to take time to care for those. I remember 2013, July 4th, 4th of July, 2013, and I was in Afghanistan. I was in Shinden Air Base, and I was visiting Farah, Bob Farah, visiting my soldiers, and I was, I was meeting a Slovenian chaplain, priest. And I got there, and I saw a small group of uh, soldiers in their small compound getting ready. And I walked over, and I was like, hey, I remember you guys. You guys from Shinden. He said, ah, yes, sir, we're down here. Uh, we're going on a mission later today. So we're doing a rock drill and uh, planning. And I said, okay, well, before you guys go out there, I'd like to say a prayer for you. 
So don't go out before I say a prayer for you. Let me go visit these people. I'll come back and say a prayer for you. And I left and visited a Slovenian uh, chaplain and visited my soldier. And then I get a call, hey, chaplain, we got to go. We have to go because there's a 4th of July party at back in Shindan, and you need to go say a prayer. So I, I rushed back and got a helicopter and flew back to Shindan. And, and then we had a beautiful... Fourth of July, Independence Day, barbecue party, and said a beautiful prayer. But that day, I got another call from the group of soldiers who went on a mission that day. PFC Errol Milliard from Birmingham, Alabama, was killed in action. A firefight that day, he died from rocket propelled grenade. It hit me really hard. I was in a slump for almost, almost a month. I was so busy with my own stuff, chaplain ministry, I didn't have time to stop and say a prayer for them. Would my, would my prayer prevented P.F. Amelia from dying? I don't know, probably not. But at least they'll know that a chaplain, someone loved them, cared, them, cared enough to say a prayer for them on their last mission before they rolled out. They will haunt, that, this will haunt me for the rest of my life. Just like the Levites and priests going down the road. They're so busy with their own agendas, own mission, own ministry, they forget about this one person. How many of us do that? I want to encourage and challenge all of you this morning that take some time and look around. All this coming, to, coming together worship, it is important, but at the end of the day, what's important is that it's the souls we save and the people we minister to. And God glorifies. And then we see the Samaritan. Jesus says, but a Samaritan. Jesus wanted to put emphasis on some Samaritan. So Levites and priests, they were the, they were the Jews of Jews. They're the, they're the example, perfect example of the Jews. And the Samaritan says, but a Samaritan, the, uh, the drastic contrast from the priests and Levites. And why? Why is that? Samaritan and Jews didn't get along at all. We all know the story, and we all know the story. Samaritans were mistreated by the Jews, and at one point, remember Jesus calling a Samaritan woman a dog? Well, compared her to a dog. And back in Israel, you have to understand, there were two kingdoms, northern kingdom and southern kingdom. They were both in captivity. So northern kingdom and captivity of Assyria, and when they were in captivity, they, they intermarried. They married with their captors, and they took their gods, and they kind of became an interracial uh, nation. And we can see that through the Book of Kings and Ezra, Deuteronomy, and Nehemiah. But Southern Kingdom, they were in captivity to uh, Babylon for 70 years. But the 70 years later, 43,000 people returned and rebuilt the Jerusalem war, uh, wall with Nehemiah. You guys, you guys remember the Nehemiah story. So that's why it is important. So Israel is the northern kingdom, uh, Samaria is the capital, Dan and uh, Bethel, and Judah is the southern kingdom, and Jerusalem as the uh, capital. So that's why the Samaritans were kind of viewed as an inferior people by the Jews, because they were mixed breed. And the Samaritans were also a continued source of difficulty to the Jews who rebuilt the Jerusalem wall after returning from Bab Babylonian captivity. And we can see that in Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2. In short, there's a long history behind their displeasure toward each other. In verse 37, the expert in the law can't even say the word Samaritan. It says the one, that one, who had pity on him. So back to the story, we see the Samaritans stopped to care for the wounded. 
and I'm sure he had pain and scars of his own from mistreatment from the Jews, but it didn't stop him from serving others. He used his own past and pain and scars and experiences to understand others' pain and suffering. Verse 33 says, the Samaritan took pity on the men, took pity. The Greek word for pity is, I can't pronounce it, but I have it written down, I promise you, which means to be moved in the inward parts. Painful movement of the internal organs, what he means. It symbolizes the shared pain. This word is used 12 times in, in the New Testament, and all the times the word is associated with Jesus. In other translations, translate is a sympathy or compassion. This is what moved Jesus and the Samaritan. Do we bear pain and scars from our past hurts and pains and use them as a mirror to have compassion on others. All of us, we have pain and scars and past experiences, whether good or bad. Are we using those to help others? Are we using those to share their pain? I remember the first time I was assigned to Korea, I've got notification about 40 days before my report date. I was at Fort Blitz. My brigade chaplain called me in. I won't say his name. Brigade chaplain called me and said, hey, Chaplain Lee, you're going to Korea. I said, all right, great. I can't wait. My family will like this. I said, no, it's an unaccompanied tour. Report date is 40 days from now. Pack your bag. And I said, no. I would like to bring my family, and I need more time. Can you help me? And the brigade chaplain said, well, you can do it. I remember I was in Germany and I got 45 notice to go to Korea. So I, from Germany, I had to relocate my family to the States and then go on to Korea on a, on a company tour. And I said, so how was that experience? Like, oh, it was horrible. It was hard on my family, hard on everybody. Okay, well now you're in a position to do something about it. Can you help? He's like, no, 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 I did it. You should do it. Too many times that's our, that's our attitude. When we people suffering and dying and hurting, it's like, yeah, yeah, I remember those times. Well, well, good luck to you. I made it. Hope you make it too. But our attitude should be the attitude of compassion. I remember, I remember when I was in that situation, how painful it was, how devastating it was. Let me help you. Let me see what I can do for you. Let me, let me see what I can do to support you. Samaritan, I, I am sure the Levites and priests, they have all the privileges they could ever imagine. Samaritan, I'm pretty sure he was mistreated left and right all the time. But he was the one who took pity, had a compassion on the dying person and helped him. And before I wrap, this, wrap up the sermon, I want to pause for a moment and be honest with myself and ourselves. And I'm afraid that modern day churches are becoming too much like the expert in the law and priests and Levites. Expert in the law says, what must I do to be saved, have eternal life, inherit eternal life? What must I do? It's all about me, I, what I can do, what I can offer God. God, what I can offer you. God, I have all this I can offer you. Use it for your glory and your honor, but make sure I get some glory too. Because I'm giving you my talent, gift, my ability. But then when things don't go the way we want and we just try to justify ourselves, no, when, when, how many of you have done that? Like I, I've, I've done it too many times in my life and, and when, when God tells me something and I try to just can't, do it, then I try to justify myself. Like, God, I can't do it. I, God, this is why you're wrong, God, and list out things. Do we do that? And sometimes we're so caught up in our on our rituals of worship that we forget the true meaning of worship. 
we are more concerned about the church gathering and we forget the true meaning of what it means to be Christians. Book of James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 says, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep the tight rein on his tongue, pardon, my wife's giving me a dirty look now, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. The Bible says, you can't go out and just proclaim that you're religious and you're doing all these things for God and the world and country and do all that, but it says if you don't keep a tight rein on your tongue and keep your mouth shut, it says your, your religion, your service is worthless. It doesn't mean anything. It says the religion or the worship that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And that's what worship is, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. How are we worshiping God today? Worship isn't just coming to church on Sunday morning, wearing fancy clothes, but worship is daily struggle to look after those who are in need and fighting against the influence of the world. The Bible tells us that's what the worship is. And lastly, I want to challenge you, us, that the church needs to be like the inn, and we need to be the innkeeper. The Samaritan brings the, the wounded person to the inn and says, hey, look after him, and if there's any extra cause, I'll repay you when I come back. I'll reimburse you. Just look after him. That's all he says. And I want to, I'll say Samaritan is like Jesus. He's bringing to the end, the church, those who are dying and suffering. And he's asking us to take care of them. Jesus said, take care of them. And this, in this place, we have a lot of young soldiers come in seeking the truth. And you'd be surprised how many, how many young soldiers actually come to this place find, trying to find the truth. You know, you figure these young soldiers, young, young, I don't want to say kids, young adults, you figure they'll, they'll go to contemporary worship, but they want to come here and sing hymns because they're seeking the truth. This, this is church they grew up knowing and comfortable with. And they're suffering and dying in pain. And it is our job as an innkeeper, the Christians, mature Christians, to look after them. Samaritan says, look after them. And whatever extra expense they might, you might incur, I, I'll reimburse you. Jesus says that, Jesus says that take care of them. Whatever extra expenses you might, you might, that there might be, I'll pay you back. I'll come back when I come back. I'll reimburse you. The church should be providing healing for those dying in the world. And God's given us all unique gifts and talents, and we need to use them for his glory and his honor and to take entrusted in our care. Sometimes it feels like it's not fair. It's costing us time, effort, money. But Jesus said, when I come back, when I come back, and we believe and wait for the second coming of a Christ. Jesus says, look after, take care of my sheep. And this is what our daily worship should be. We can do this, not because we're the expert in the law, not because we know all this, we have this great ability to do it, it's not about I, the expert of the law says, what must I do? It's not about I, it's about God. What Christ had done on the cross for us first. At this time, as we prepare our hearts and minds for communion, I want to sing, Jesus paid it all together. Sing one verse together as we prepare our hearts for a communion. It says, I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch him pray. Find me in, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him. Oh, 
Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it as white as snow. It's not about us. And today, it's about Christ whom crucified that on the cross. So as we prepare our hearts for communion, communion is about remembrance, remembering what Christ had done for us on the cross for my sin and your sin. We can do this. We can serve God. We can use our pains and suffering and experiences, past experiences, to help others, not because we're just such wonderful people, but because of what Christ had done for us first. So let's sing together this one verse of Jesus paid it all as we prepare our hearts for communion. Savior say thy strength in thee is small child of weakness watch and pray finding me thine all in all Jesus pay 